Hi, everyone. Thank you all so much for joining us on our webinar today. For our names are Destiny, Lorinda, Jose, and we are navigating homelessness during COVID-19. To get us started, we just wanted to do a little bit of housekeeping. So um, this webinar is currently being recorded and will be archived on our website in a few days. Um, if you have questions, please feel free to ask it on the panel. As you can see on the slide right here, we'll have breaks in between um, our questions to stop and ask the attendees to ask their questions. So feel free to ask questions throughout that time. And again, uh, just to respect the privacy of our youth that are, we're just so thankful to be here. Um, we just want to have a reminder to please not take any screenshots or do any recordings for your own personal use. And if you have any questions or any media or press inquiries, please contact Jordan Rourke. Her email address is listed at the bottom of the slide and it also will be at the end of the presentation. Um, if you have any questions or for the youth, um, we can put you in contact with them. So my name is Jillian Sitar. I am the Higher Education Program Manager at Schoolhouse Connection. Uh, my background actually is in higher education and student affairs, specifically in housing and multiculturalism. So for all the higher ed professionals that are on campuses, I definitely feel for you during these unprecedented times. And just thank you for all the work that you're doing. My role at Schoolhouse Connection is to ensure that youth experiencing homelessness are transitioning to and through higher education. And so I work with different liaisons, counselors in the high schools, higher ed professionals, other service providers to identify best practices that best support this population and create different resources and tools and guides to share these best practices. And so a little bit about Schoolhouse Connection. We are a national nonprofit based in Washington, DC with our mission to overcome homelessness through education. And we do that both on the practice side as well as the policy side on the federal and state level. So if you wanna learn a little bit more about us, you can click on the website here on the slide. Um, I'm gonna have Jordan on the chat box portion uh, send the Facebook group where we have a ton of different professionals that share um, different resources, ask questions, just have wealth of knowledge on that Facebook group. So if you wanna join, um, it's on the chat box. You can also sign up for our newsletter where you can get all of these resources directly to your mailbox. So today we have the honor and privilege of hearing from three amazing youth from our Youth and Leadership Scholarship Program. They're gonna be talking about what their lives have been like these last few months um, with the coronavirus pandemic. They're gonna share a little bit about their experience navigating college during this time, but also just some guidance and advice for other higher ed professionals and service providers and others that are working with specific student populations like themselves. And then again, we have the opportunity for you all to ask questions. So please ask questions um, to our youth panel and feel free to share any other insights or any other comments. So we just wanted to kind of provide some context of what homelessness looks like before um, COVID-19. And so this is from the Department of Ed from 2017 to 2018. There were an estimated 1.5 million um, youth students that were identified. And so it's important to note that when we're talking about students experiencing homelessness in college, they probably also experienced homelessness when they were in high school or much younger. And as you can see from the chart, this was an upward trend. And we're expecting that with the coronavirus pandemic, these numbers are only gonna be increasing. And these statistics are from the University of Chicago Chapin Hall Voices of Youth Count, which is the largest national survey of unaccompanied homeless youth um, that's existed. And so as you can see from the first bullet, 3.5 million young adults ages 18 to 25 experience homelessness over the course of their own over that year. So in other words, about one in 10 of these youth. And from that group, about 29% of them had experienced homelessness in the previous 12 months were also enrolled in a college or an educational program. And so we know that higher education is so important because right now a high school degree just isn't what it used to be a few years ago. You really need a post-secondary education in order to find a job that pays enough to afford stable housing. We also know that there's a direct link between high school and college graduation with important indicators of health and well-being. And then from this chart, and again, that's from the Voices of Youth Count that I mentioned on the previous slide, 
we see a direct link between education and homelessness. So if you see on the first um, portion, young adults without a high school diploma or GED were 4.5 times more likely to experience homelessness than their peers. And reversely, um, homelessness is also a risk factor for lower educational attainment rate. With young adults who've experienced homelessness were at least one third less likely to be enrolled in a four-year college in comparison to their peers. And so we truly do believe education is a preventative tool for experiencing homelessness, for preventing it, as well as stopping the cycle of homelessness. We know that um, the impact of coronavirus and higher education, it's gonna be a direct impact with enrollment and retention. And so this slide um, is featuring a few polls that we've seen for seniors. Um, the bottom one is from a survey of over a thousand high school seniors. 69% of students perceive that the coronavirus is gonna impact their higher education financial situation. So what this means is that we might be seeing an increase in something called the summer melt. This is when high school seniors have every intention of enrolling in the college um, in the fall. They might have paid their deposit, they might have paid you know, all of the funds and everything. And then after high school graduation, they don't actually end up going to that college. And it could be for a variety of reasons. They might have decided to do a gap year. They might have decided to switch from a four-year institution to a community college. They might have just decided, you know, I'm just, maybe college isn't the right move just right now. And so we're expecting that we're gonna see a huge increase in summer melt. So for our high school um, counselors and liaisons that are joining in, we really just want to say, please reach out to your students to help ease that transition, keep them on track, keep them supported so they can make it onto their college campuses. And then for current students, um, they are also being impacted as well. And so this is from a survey conducted from the American Association of College Registrars and Admissions Officers as well, and ACE. And they found that about 10% of students that are currently enrolled, they're now uncertain if they'll enroll in the fall because of the coronavirus. So this is really impacting all college students and all aspects. And so we, before we turn it over to our youth, because those are the people that you wanna hear from the most, we briefly just wanted to talk about our youth leadership and scholarship program. And so this really is an amazing program full of a peer network that just provides support in all aspects. We provide a community support, financial support, just everything. And so I'm so happy to announce that our scholarship is gonna be live come tomorrow. Jordan is gonna go ahead and link um, our page on the chat box. So check back on that page tomorrow to see the application to figure out um, the qualifications, eligibility, and what the scholarship entails. But it really is an amazing uh, program, and I'm so thankful and grateful to hear from three of our students who are part of that program right now. And so with that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to our scholars. Um, our first one will be Jose, who's joining us on video right now, and then I'll turn it over to Lorinda, and then Destiny. If you wanna briefly introduce yourself, um, share your name, where you're from, what college you're at, what you're studying, just anything you want to share. So I'll go ahead Hi, and turn. Hi everyone. Um, my name is Jose Mendoza. Uh, born and raised in New York City. I go to Columbia College. I'm studying psychology. I'll be graduating later this spring and I'll be the first in my family to do so. Graduate from college, that is. <laughs> Hi everyone, uh, my name is Lorinda Bruce, and I'm finishing up my sophomore year at Georgetown in DC and I'm from um, right outside Kansas City, Missouri. Hi everyone, I'm Destiny. I'm from California and I'm currently attending San Diego State University and also majoring in psychology. Awesome. So as I shared on um, one of the previous slides, a lot of students that were experiencing homelessness in college also experienced homelessness in high school. And so we just wanted to ask, you know, why is higher education so important to you? Um, if you have experienced homelessness in high school, you made it to graduation and decided to pursue a higher education. And so if you just wanted to share why higher, uh, higher education is important to you. And I'll turn it over to Jose and then Destiny, and then Lorinda. Well, higher education is extremely important. Um, it opens up a lot of opportunities. 
Um, it means being able to qualify for the jobs that you want, the jobs that are going to be paying decent salaries, um, get to learn about a lot of topics you want to be able to learn anywhere, especially the high schools that I've been in. <laughs> and, um, uh, you know, you just get to interact with people from a lot of backgrounds and something I value a lot about my higher, about my time in higher education right now. Hi, um, higher education is really important to me because I was homeless my entire um, high school career and I was homeless with my family and my family is still currently homeless and the only reason I was able to stop being homeless was by going to college and pursuing my degree and I, I just I'm really passionate about it because I want to be able to maintain stability and eventually get stability for my family. Yeah, um, I think probably higher education is important to me just because as education as a whole um, is something that my mom really valued when I was growing up. Um, I like just grew up with my mom and my brother and so we experienced like homelessness just like varying times um, kind of just throughout our life from when I was younger to um, when I was in high school. Um, and I guess it was just like education was always a safe space and something that I knew that I was good at. So um, higher education is really just like an opportunity to kind of continue that. Um, and like, I guess it wasn't until um, probably like four years after my mom passed away. So just a few months ago that I find, oop, sorry, <laughs> that I found out that um, my mom never graduated high school, um, which was something that she never told us before she passed away. Um, so I think it's just the fact that, I don't know, even for someone like my mom who um, just went her whole life without the opportunity to get a high school degree, let alone um, a university degree, it's something I'm really grateful for. And before we get to the next slide, um, if anyone wants to share what they are pursuing, um, what their master's or what their um, major is or what they want to be, um, if anyone wants to share that. Yeah, um, I'll go ahead. Um, so my major is culture and politics, um, and I'm concentrating in migration, identity, and tech. Um, so I kind of just want to go into immigration law um, and kind of do public interest work. I am majoring in psychology. This is Destiny, by the way. Um, I am majoring in psychology because I. Um, I, I just saw a lot of people that were struggling with their mental health and I just think that it's something that's really important and that needs to be taken seriously and that needs to be more talked about and broadcasted and not something that like people are ashamed of or not talked about. So yeah. I'm a psychology major. Um, growing up, my mom, she suffered from mental health issues. And so um, in college, I realized eh, in college, there were a lot of people who also suffered from mental health issues because things like stress from the um, crazy course loads, stuff like that, just a very stressful environment. So um, I want to use my psychology major to get into clinical psychology, clinical um, psychology, and I hope, you know, in a few years to be practicing therapy or something like that. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you all for sharing. And so next, um, we'd really love to just kind of hear what your college experience has been like since mid-March when college closures started happening. So if you want to share, you know, what was being communicated to you? Did you have a person, a point of contact on your campus that was explaining what was happening? Um, did you know, you know, where were you going to live? Where were you going to access food? Um, feel free to just kind of share what you feel like sharing during this time. So we'll start again with Jose, and then we'll go Destiny and Lorinda. Um, well, my school initially, mid-March, um, they told us not to worry. You know, even though other schools were closing, they said, 
you guys are not going to be kicked out of your dorms, but whoever is able to leave their dorm should be doing that. <laughs> but literally <laughs> a week later, <laughs> they did a whole 360 and they said, you have 48 hours to leave your dorm, pack up everything. And this was during spring break. So luckily I was on campus still, <laughs> but there were a lot of people who weren't in the city. They weren't in the state or some people weren't even in the country <laughs> and they were making everyone, you know, pack their things up within such a short amount of time. So <laughs> it was, everything was very, I go to a pretty large school. So everything was very chaotic. It was like unclear who I had to reach out to for help. You know, it was also unclear what help they were providing. And um, yeah, it was very chaotic. That's all I got to say. <laughs> Um, for me at San Diego State, I only got information via mass emails that the school was sending out, and some of them I wouldn't even get, and I would have to hear the information from someone else, and they'd be like, oh, did you get this email? I'd be like, no, I didn't get that email. Um, so it was very disorganized. And there were a lot of like fake emails going out, like asking like student workers to like submit like information about their checks and like different stuff. And it was very confusing on what was real and what wasn't real. And I didn't have a person to, I didn't have a point of contact on campus. I didn't have like a person that's like, okay, I can go talk to this person and find out what's really happening. I kind of had to just figure out what everyone else was doing. Um, but I was lucky enough that like I live off campus so I wasn't really worried about being kicked off of campus and like having to go home um but I was worried about like not being able to pay rent and getting kicked out of my apartment so, yeah oh also sorry um another thing I know they were asking about assessing food accessing food um I mainly fed myself on campus um, and I like rely on EBT to feed myself at home. And so when campus closed and all of like the meal halls or whatever you call them closed, um, I was really stressing about how I was gonna feed myself basically because now I was home five days a week that I wasn't home and having to figure out how I was gonna eat and when I was gonna eat. So yeah. Um, I would say that probably my experience over the last few months, I've been like really, really blessed in um, the way that the school has like approached the situation um, for me where um, so I was able to like apply to stay on campus um, and I got my application approved. I know a lot of people didn't, um, um, especially people who may have had like family um, who were high risk or had family who were nurses and now kind of face the consequences of that in the sense that now they have like family members who are infected. But um, kind of with my application being approved, I was able to move into um, just another kind of like apartment building that was more um, like a socially distanced. Um, and then there's certain times a day that the dining hall has food, which is really, really helpful. Um, I would say that, so in that sense, I've been just really grateful. Um, I've been getting a lot of my information from probably students, um, kind of like student mutual aid group chats have formed for the people on campus, which I think is a really good tool because I think that like, yes, we get emails from like the administrators, but like sometimes the emails are ambiguous or confusing and they're not as frequent. So to be able to have people within the group chat who are like directly student advocates for us and it's more of an informal setting. There's more of a trust that I think that um, we've seen in being able to like actually actualize some of our like desires. Um, like for example, like some of like the food options or small stuff like that. I would say that probably like the start of um, kind of the experience of just whenever like the school extensions or virtual instruction was announced was probably the most confusing um, because I went 
like home for about like a week, a week and a half. And during that time, I like, didn't have Wi-Fi and then my cell phone sh like service got turned off. So um, it was just like, I just couldn't do classes. And then it was just, I don't know, like a really just anxious time because it's like, you just don't show up for classes. And I don't know, it, yeah, it was just weird. Um, but, but yeah, but I, I've been like really blessed throughout most of the last few months. Thank oh, you. Sorry, I just wanted to add on because I see a question. <laughs> Where were you able to go <laughs> after being given such short notice? Well, for me, um, um, I was given 48 hours, but luckily I was still on campus and I didn't go too far away from my house. I, st I live in the city and um, basically, um, uh, my sister, luckily, um, she lives nearby my college. So I asked her to come help me. And I asked her if there was any way I could, you know, cr crash with her for, you know, for, you know, since I was, I'm, be I'm being kicked out of my, my school, right? So right now I'm just um, staying on the couch. <laughs> luckily, my sister was able to, you know, help me out a little bit. But I can't imagine um, what I would be doing if I didn't have that option. <laughs> and for my school, basically, what they had told people who, um, in order to apply for housing, they they were letting certain people stay on campus, but it was only if you had any immediate danger returning home, or or if you were an international student who. Um, who wasn't able to return to the country, but there was nothing being said about students who, you know, might not have a home to return to. But luckily, I did have my sister to help me out. Thank you so much for sharing. I think all of you kind of touched on when you were receiving communication, it wasn't concise, it was really confusing, and it sounds like for most of you, you've been relying on friends or other peers to find out, you know, what what was it legit, what was actually happening, what was being offered on campus. Um, and I don't think any of you mentioned like a specific person on campus that was there. Um, I know some institutions might have someone called a homeless higher education liaison or a single point of contact. Um, and it sounds like none of you necessarily had a person or an organization or someone doing direct outreach. Um, so with that, I just wanted to kind of break and see if we have any other questions that are coming in. Um, let me see. We've gotten a lot of responses of people just saying that you are all an inspiration and congratulations. Um, we can go ahead and continue, but just a reminder, feel free to ask questions. We'll do another portion at the end. We have a few more questions to ask our youth, but if folks have any questions right now, um, feel free to do it in the chat box, but we'll go ahead and keep on trucking. All right, um, some of you have already touched on this, but what are the, some of the challenges that you faced and are still currently facing during this time? Uh, we'll go again, Jose and then Destiny and Lorinda. Well, uh, one of the challenges I'm facing, <laughs> even right now, um, my Wi-Fi is like pretty bad, <laughs> so everything is online. But luckily, my cell phone provider is like being very generous right now, and it's just offering everyone like unlimited data <laughs> because of everything going on. So most of the times, I'm having to use um, what do you call it, hotspot, in order to you know gain access to the internet. Uh, Another thing that really sucks right now is as a last semester senior, all my job applications have been put on hold or just canceled because of everything going on. They're just, you know, um, if they're not canceled, they're just saying everything needs to get back to normal before we're able to reach, um, before we're able to get back to you. So <laughs> that's just something I'm, I'm very worried about right now. <laughs> just my job prospects <laughs> with everything going on. Destiny? Yes, so um, I have two main worries. One of my biggest worries right now is that um, 
this spring, I've been retaking two courses that are required for me to get into my major because right when it's an impacted major. So until you um, complete some of like the prerequisites, you're considered like a pre-psychology major. Um, and the first time I took the courses, I had some really serious um, physical health issues. And so I wasn't able to attend class for like a month or so. And my grades reflected that. And so now I was retaking them and I was doing pretty good, but then everything started shutting down. And now it's kind of like I'm trying to teach myself the material that I already couldn't learn the first time around. And um, it's just, it's been really frustrating because the teachers aren't teaching the courses. They're just like putting up a lecture and can't like for us to just watch on our own time and not really teaching during class or like having time for like, a, like to just actually teach us the material at all. Um, so I'm just worried about not being able to get into my major and how that's going to like set me back a semester or two semesters because I, I have already registered for my summer and fall classes. And if I don't pass these two classes, then I'm not going to be able to take the courses that I'm registered for. Uh, so yeah, that's the one thing that's been super frustrating. Um, and then aside from that, just like my mental health with everything that's going on, it's just been a lot of stress on me to just just like take it all in and not really be able to do anything about it. Um, so yeah. Thank you for sharing. Lorinda? Yeah, um, definitely just like building off of that. I think um, mental health has probably been one of the biggest challenges for me um, and also just like creating some type of routine. I think that like I've probably been struggling the most with like my sleep cycle so like normally like I've been like going to bed at like 7 a.m or like 8 a.m um and then I'll sleep till like 4 p.m and then like sometimes I'll like wake up for classes and I try to do like melatonin and stuff like that to fix things and it's like not working but I also think it's like a weird combination of like oh like there's weird hours but also like these are like in part like depression naps and like I don't know, there's just like a lot where I feel like being like boxed in and like, I think it's a really rainy day in now. like it definitely doesn't kind of help, um, help my mood, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so um, I, I've still had like some access to therapy, which has been like helpful um, and has been nice, but it's still just like, yeah, but it's still like hard, <laughs> but yeah. Great. Um, so we have a lot of folks that are joining us from different colleges and campuses or liaisons who are working with students preparing for college. What do you wish you could tell these individuals that are working with students who are in similar experiences like yourself? Any advice, just any guidance, anything that you wish to share? So Jose, Lorinda, and then Destiny. Well, I think the most important thing is um, I for them not to assume everyone has the same circumstances at home because I feel like a lot of my professors have been doing that and the only way they I feel like they they have done any like changes to what they're asking for is if you if if is if, if I I have to go ahead and I have to reach out to them and explain like um explain my circumstances they're not the ones reaching out to me so I really think um, you know, any educational, any education professional should be, you know, reaching out to their students and asking them, hey, how is everything going on? What's going on at home? Like, is everything okay? Like, yeah, that's, I think that's the most important thing. And then, um, another thing is making sure that all the needs of, you know, low-income students are being met at home. If you expect them to produce the same quality of work, they need to have, you know, they need to have their needs met in order to be still able to produce the same quality of work that they expect them to be producing. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, I probably have like really similar like sentiments and thoughts. Um, I would say like just adding on to that, um, I think one thing that I appreciated was that I had 
um, like members from our like campus ministry, um, like they like individually like reached out to me um, and um, like Georgetown's a Jesuit school. So like we have like a campus ministry that's I guess like um, does stuff. <laughs> Um, but like they individually reach out to me and the fact that like someone did like reach out like was just super appreciated and just like the fact that like the email said like hi Lorinda instead of like just like hi everyone was just I don't know it was nice. Um, but then also I think maybe even like small things like that a lot of like professors like I don't know at least for me like I've been like chastised if I didn't have my camera turned on or um, like there, I think it's honestly like a rule that maybe like some professors are just like not following, but um, like professors would like ask about like what's behind like someone or um, like observations about people's like room and location. And it's just like very like jarring to see just some people's like backgrounds or like really cool like paintings that like look like really expensive. And I just like don't really feel like starting every class with like an explanation of it because um, it doesn't feel the best. But um, yeah, and then I think like just stuff like that. Um, and then um, also just like keeping in touch with like student advocates who are on campus because I feel like, I don't know, it's sometimes you trust information like more when it comes from a student than you do from the administrators. Um, so I guess those are just a few thoughts. Um, I'm definitely going to echo a couple of the things that Jose and Lorinda said. Um, I My biggest thing is just like recognizing that it's not just the pandemic and it's not just like, okay, everyone's staying at home. I know personally for me, right before the pandemic hit, I was going through a lot of stuff mentally. I had just lost a family member. I had was not talking to my best friend anymore. There was like a lot of stuff I was personally dealing with. And then for everything to just kind of go up in flames, it was just like, okay, I don't, I don't know what to do. I don't know what's happening. I was trying to deal with so many things. And I feel like, like Lorinda was like pointing out, like, if you're asking, or, and Jose as well, like if you're asking students to perform at a certain level, you have to consider the students who are living in hotels who don't have internet access, who don't have this or that, or the things like you're expecting people to have. Some students have to do all of their work from their cell phone because they don't have a laptop to do it. And it's just like, to a certain extent, you don't really wanna like speak up and say, hey, I'm living in a hotel room with my six other family members. I can't turn my video camera on. Or can you like, it's just like, so I guess I wanna like support what Jose said and like reaching out to students and like just checking on them individually and not just like blasting out mass messages like Lorinda said, like personally being like, hey, are you okay? What do you specifically need for you to be able to function in this class the way that it's being Fun, like performed currently so yeah thank you all for sharing it sounds like definitely having that intentional outreach um, following up seeing that folks are getting their basic needs met is super important and also sounds like since you are interacting with faculty the most virtually um, having them you know being a little bit more sensitive to your needs because those are the folks that you're seeing more often on the video camera and everything so I know in higher education and student affairs there sometimes is that divide between academic affairs and student affairs so I think that's definitely one way that higher ed professionals can better support these students is working with their faculty, letting them know what questions to ask, how to be a better support system. Let them know that students experiencing homelessness do exist. And, you know, just for many of the reasons why that folks have shared, they might not be able to put their camera on for a variety of reasons. One being that they might not have access to a laptop. So um, I think just bridging that gap is definitely one huge thing that higher ed professionals can do. So with that, we'll go to um, our last question before we go to the many questions that we're getting from our attendees. What advice do you have for other college students who are going through something pretty similar? Um, it could be something small. It could be, you know, a Netflix recommendation. It could be something for mental health. It can just be 
anything that you think would be helpful for other students who might be going through a situation similar to yours. And again, we'll go Jose first, and then I'll switch it to Destiny and then Lorinda. Um, right now, one very one thing that's been helping me go um, get through all of this is I've never used my school's psychological services before until just like until a few weeks ago. And if you do, if your school is still, luckily my school is still offering psychological services during this time. I'm not sure if, you know, if that's the case for most schools, but my school is still offering that. And I've been very lucky, lucky and that they still are. And um, it's, I was able to reach out and make an appointment and I was able to speak with a mental health professional and they've really been helping me get through this time. All right, and then Lorinda, or that's, that's me. Yes, sorry. Um, I was actually gonna say exactly what Jose said. Um, my school also has like um, psychological um, help and like like counseling centers and everything. And even though I my personal issues were like extensive and like couldn't be um, like encaptured in like the limits of like what the school system can do, they helped me get to off campus like psych psychological help where I'm it's affordable and like works with my insurance or like whatever it is that I needed, they helped me get there. Um, so I, I really wanted to recommend that. Um, but I also wanted to recommend uh, one thing I know that San Diego State has is an economic crisis response team. It's like an ECRT. And um, I don't know if a lot of other schools have it. Like I know it's like not every school has it, but it's like, it's been super helpful for me before and during the pandemic. And like, that's like the first thing I recommend to anyone when they tell me anything. I'm like, please apply, tell them what your situation is. They can help you and they'll, and if they can't help you, they will give you a bunch of different links and resources to something that can help you. So, yeah. Yeah, um, I guess maybe like one thing that I would say is, um, that like we're all in a pandemic so everyone from like students professors to admin um, obviously the situation is chaotic and for everyone um, I would say that like that I've had like professors who have made like I guess been more flexible than but also some who have it um, so I think like for me as I just started um, I guess to realize that, like, I mean, I'm about to finish up the semester in a week, but like that it's okay to ask and like demand like some type of flexibility or greater flexibility, or also like demand some type of solution to a situation. Like, for example, um, I had a test that like I had taken um, and I like ended up getting a really like just a really not great grade on it um which affected my like score um in a really big way but because of the closure of like the academic buildings the test was locked away um inside so there was no way that i would be able to like understand why i got such a poor grade even if like maybe it could have been an error with the grading so i had to like reach out to the professor and like we were able to agree that like I would be able to review it in the fall and um, like possibly get like the situation um, where I could get the grade adjusted if something were to happen. Um, so I think like, I don't know, like there are really inconvenient things that happened or and are happening because of this pandemic for everyone, but also like not being afraid to like demand some type of solution to it. No, I think those are all great advice, being an advocate for yourself. Um, I'm so thankful that all three of you have mentioned that you're able to access mental health services on your campus. So for students who are on college campuses, that's definitely one avenue to look into. And then um, Destiny mentioned the um, emergency 
organization. Um, I know a lot of campuses do offer emergency aid money and with the new CARES Act that are that's going to be coming in, that's something definitely that students can keep in mind is figuring out if there's an application or what you need to do to get access to the CARES funding that should be coming out in the next few weeks. Um, and so with that, we got a ton of questions from our panelists or from our attendees. So I'm going to um, kind of like I'll go to one for Jose first. What are you doing? What are they doing for your graduation? I mean, you're going to be done with college soon. So what what's the next steps? I'm so sad. I'm so sad. Um, my gowns, they're so nice. So I was really looking forward to taking pics in them and like <laughs> having my family, you know, take pics with me, you know, because they're, they're like a really nice light blue color. <laughs> and I'm just so upset that I'm not going to be able to, you know, show off a little bit. <laughs> but um, what my school is doing for um, for graduation is, is going to be online. <laughs> and they asked us to submit a photo and a little like blurb that they're going to show in the presentation. And they're going to um, announce our names and our majors. And it's sort of like what they would do if they were in person, but except it's not in person. <laughs> well, we are more than happy to take photos in your blue robes for you if you would like to do so. Um, you can put them on right now if you want to do, Jose. <laughs> um, so I'm kind of lumping in a few questions. A lot of folks are asking about that transition from in-person to online classes. Um, how has that fit your learning style? Do you feel like you have the resources to be successful? Has any of your colleges reached out to provide additional assistance? Um, has anyone offered, you know, tutoring? Um, do you think tutoring would help? So if anyone wants to go ahead and take a stab at that transition from in-person learning to online learning. Um, I would like to go. I just want to say that like I've taken online courses before and they're not a problem at all if the course is prepared and intended to be taught online. And so it's not really a problem that we're learning online. The problem is transitioning to online and grades being shuffled around and emails getting lost and not really understanding what's happening. A lot of my courses like completely revised our coursework entirely where it was like beforehand like I had a certain amount of exams and I was like okay I'm going to study for this one and then it turned into we're not having exams at all now you have a writing assignment and it was just like so many things were getting switched around and like just completely changing that it was like hard to keep track of like what was happening and what wasn't happening anymore um so yeah Anyone else want to share? Um, for me, um, when we were first transitioning, um, a lot of professors were trying to um, basically replicate an in-person course and make it force it to be online. For example, um, my professor had, you know, basically she told us that she had written out the an exam, a midterm exam, and she had it in paper. It was supposed to be taken in person. And what she did was she made it online, but she made it much more difficult because she was like, oh, people are going to be, you know, are going to be able to access, you know, their textbooks or their, you know, their notes. So it was just very like weird, like seeing this very difficult exam that was so supposed to be a lot easier, but because you know it trend, she for, made it, she forced it to be online. It ended up being a lot more difficult than it was supposed to be. So that's something <laughs> that was like very difficult at first, but luckily, you know, it, she stopped doing that, and now it's all essays instead of exams. So, but at first it was like very chaotic. Um, I would like to echo what Jose said too. That happened to me in one of the classes that I'm retaking. It's a stats class and 
the professor tried to make it as if it was an in class exam where we had to show all our work and all the formulas had to be like written correctly and it was just like a whole lot of things that they wanted us to do and I'm normally a person where like I finish exams like 30 40 minutes before we're supposed to be done just because I'm a fast test taker and I didn't get to like half of the questions a lot of people didn't get to finish the exam because there were so many requirements and they only gave us like an hour to do it, it as if we were like in class writing and taking it and it was just like well you can't expect us to perform exactly the same on an entirely new platform yeah I would like echo that um I think maybe like one professor that I've seen handle it out of like everyone um, and the way he approached it was like at the start of the um, of all the changes he had like everyone fill out like a survey and it like had like individual and this was like a group of like 50 like 60 students um, and it had like time zone differences it had like individual needs it had anything that like we wanted to express and then he also for like basically all um, assignments, instead of it being due at like 11.59 on like Tuesday, he gives us like this due date, but then there's like a three day window for us to do it. Um, and then like for the final exam, I think he was planning on making it take home anyway, but it's like an essay format. Um, but then on the other hand, like I've had like professors um, who maybe like, are like more I guess like suspicious or like wary of like what they would be like consider like cheating or um like I don't know like I guess like violations of academic dishonesty but I don't know like I, I don't know it's just like a weird situation because I'm like I, I feel bad saying this to like a group of educators but like yes like it's so important to like be like do your work and be like academically honest but also we're in like an actual pandemic where like situations are so different that like you students don't need an email like questioning like their work especially if they did do it like without any assistance um so kind of like some of that suspicion kind of is not the most helpful but but i understand it to an extent awesome it sounds like some faculty members are being accommodating, some are making things more barriers. So again, just want to emphasize that partnership between academic affairs and student affairs, help educate some of our faculty on some of the nuances. Um, another question that folks feel free to answer, have you had someone in your life that has really been helpful during this time? It could be a faculty member, friend, um, what is their role and what is something that they did that helped? So I'll turn it to whoever wants to go first. Um, I'm really grateful for my older sister. You know, if I weren't for her, I don't, I don't know where I would be right now. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm really grateful for her, and you know, she's been, she's been, you know, <laughs> a great, great to have in my life at this moment. Very grateful for her. Um, I've been really grateful for my roommate right now. Um, like a lot of for the students who are on campus um most of them are like living by themselves because of social distancing but i was um able to room with one of my friends um and it's just been like that's just been a really good source of like relief um and i think we've been a good support system in the sense that she's like a graduating senior so she's also like dealing with some of the hecticness of post-graduation plans um but then also like she's been able to be like a good like mentor type force for me um and it's i guess it's also like a way for accountability so like she sometimes can like yell at me to like get up when i am sleeping till like 6 p.m so all right another question that we got from our group or for our group is did any of your campuses create a computer loan program or gave out Wi-Fi hotspots for students? So any sort of technology help? Nothing. <laughs> there was nothing. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Um, 
Um, so for San Diego, I know that they like sent out a like a like, and it was very briefly mentioned in one of the mass emails. They were basically like, if you need help, then like click on this link or something like that. But I don't know what the extent of like the help was, or if they were providing hotspots or computer stuff. It just kind of said technical help. It didn't really said it. It didn't. It didn't really say. It, do you, if you need a computer, click here, or if you need access to Wi-Fi, click here. It was kind of just like, if you need technical help. Yeah, um, I think that the, it was in an email that like it's an option for students to request um, hotspots, but I don't really know the details of like what that was. Um, and I didn't see any advertisements for like offering a computer or kind of anything in that Another question that we got, um, what are y'all's thoughts about the upcoming summer in the fall semester? So obviously, Jose, you're going to be graduating, which is so amazing. We're so happy for you. But for Lorenda or Destiny, has there been any communication about the summer and the fall? Um, for me, I don't think we've received anything about fall, but we did receive an email saying that all summer classes are online, um, which I kind of figured was going to happen, so it wasn't really a surprise. Um, so yeah, that's like the main communication that I've gotten is that like all summer classes are being moved online. Um, yeah, so I think so all summer classes are moved online and normally there are um, students who would like come for different like high school programming who would be on campus um, and like all of that is canceled as well. I think that probably I think in like two ish weeks I think I saw in some group chat is when we might hear more about um, like what the plans are for fall but because it's kind of ever changing then it makes sense that that's in flux. Um, we did get like, I just filled out a survey um, today where it had like a little comment box about um, like what would your concerns be about the fall. Um, I think something that has been nice is I think like every week so far we've gotten an email that's like how engaged have you been with classes and I think it's just collecting kind of some data. Um, so that's been nice and um, but yeah, so I think it's just pretty unclear, but I feel like that's the situation for about everything. Awesome. And another question that we got in is, do you think having a pass or an incomplete would be better than actually receiving a grade for some of your courses? So, um, oh, go ahead. No, you go ahead, it's fine. <laughs> um, yeah, so our deadline, um, so we had, so originally, it was like a pass fail option and then it morphed into like a I honestly can't even remember it it's like credit no credit and then some other option that it basically is the same thing but like everyone was fighting for a double a system where like students get like an a or an a minus and it was like a really big campaign on campus um but that failed and so that is kind of what initiated the change um but but yeah, so we had until yesterday to decide whether we were going to do like the weird pass fail system. Um, and I didn't do any. I think like I like wanted just because my finals make up such a significant portion of my grade, like I didn't want to risk um, doing pass fail because that doesn't help your GPA. Um, and I'm thinking of going to law school and I'm applying in pretty soon. So it kind of just wasn't an option for me. I think what would have been the most helpful is if the deadline for when we could have decided pass fail was extended until after we got our final grades. Um, just because it's really like until you have like your final project in or your final assignment in, it's really hard to gauge like how that's going to impact your grade. Who's their destiny? Any other thoughts? Um, yeah, I wanted to say um, kind of similar to what Lorinda was saying that pass 
the so my option was credit no credit or withdraw from the class um and so I, my deadline for credit no credit is tomorrow and then the withdrawal is like may 7th i think um and like our semester ends on the 14th i believe um and it's it's again like it's something that doesn't really help me because i have to get my major requires to me requires me to get a certain letter grade in the course for it to count towards me getting into the major and so if i change it to credit no credit then i would have to retake the course all over again and that would be my third time taking the course um and then even if i and so if yeah and so even if that wasn't important to me getting into the major it would be important for when i decide to go to grad school like I, they're not gonna a lot of graduate programs aren't considering aren't considering credit no credit as like you taking the class they're like well if you did good enough you should have taken the grade so obviously you didn't do great enough in that course so then why should we let you into our program and it's kind of like well this is really this doesn't help at all um i think this is a very complicated question because um my school is doing mandatory pass fail for all classes but i heard a lot of people were unhappy because some people are relying on their grades in order to get into grad school or boost their gpa or maybe a scholarship requires them to have a certain you know certain gpa each semester um but i also heard the argument that we should just automatically pass everyone because what if a student has circumstances at home where they're just not able to pass, even do the bare minimum to pass, you know? Because th there are some students who, you know, just have that situation at home. And I just think it's very complicated um, to decide what would be best for each student. And then the last question that we'll get to um, before we end with different resources is what type of communication would have been helpful to receive from your colleges? It sounds like a lot of the communications were really broad about the different COVID-19 resources, but we all, you know, a lot of colleges were trying to get information out quickly. So what do you wish you would have known um, that was communicated to you from the beginning? Um, I think I like not only from my experience, but from like the experience of people I know, I wish that um, they had like, I don't know, taken the time to like get all of their information together before they said something to us. Because like Jose pointed out one minute, it was like, oh, you're not going to have to leave the dorms. You're fine. And then the next minute it was like, OK, you have to get out now. And it was like, OK, well, that that's fun. And like. I had people who were like being forced to move like across the country and they were quitting their jobs because they couldn't work and then it, all of a sudden it was like okay well we're going to make all the students work through tele telework now and it was like okay well now this person just quit their job not knowing that they could have been able to work and they're not getting paid at all because they won't hire them anymore and it's just like well that's that's it just it was i don't know it was just really messy All right, and so with that, um, we'll end with a few resources. So we have specific COVID-19 and homeless resources. There's the link on the chat box, but also here on the slide as well. We have a specific higher ed resource that we partnered with the Hope Center and Juvenile Law Center. We have a frequently asked questions document that is updated consistently. And these are questions that we get directly to our inbox or to our weekly virtual chats or bi-weekly virtual chats that happen on Thursdays at 4 p.m. So again, all of these resources are on the slide, but also on the link in the chat box portion. We have other additional resources here that are a little bit more broadly with higher education and homelessness. Um, again, if you have any questions or if you have um, any you know, innovative solutions that you're doing on your campus to support this population, please reach out to me. Um, my email is here on the slide below. And again, for the press, for any media inquiries, please contact Jordan Work to get in communication with some of our scholars. 
but I just want to say thank you all so, so much to our scholars. We've received such amazing notes in the questions box, just giving kudos and just thanking you all for your vulnerability and for your time for being here and sharing your experiences. So I just want to say thank you again so much for joining us and for all the attendees here. Thank you for logging in. Um, everyone be safe and stay well. Thank you all. <laughs>